Hi, my name is Imran Huck, and welcome to another episode of The Voice of Atlanta, the series where I interview high achieving leaders and try and find out how they got to where they are. Every year, millions of people around the world leave their homes. Reasons include religious and human rights prosecutions. By the end of June 2015, it was estimated that there were around 15 million refugees worldwide. This week, I caught up with Julian Burnside, who's a QC lawyer in the area of commercial litigation, and he's also a human rights and refugee advocate. Yeah. Julian, welcome to The Voice of Atlanta. Thank you. You'd been wasted. You should go to the bar. These were famous words from the Chief Justice of New Zealand during a moot court when you were in, doing, during university. And he didn't say to you to go to the bar and actually drink. He meant it because he wanted you to have a career change from management consulting to being a lawyer. How did it have such a profound effect? Um, well, first of all, um, I, I had not intended practice as a lawyer. Um, I had vague ideas of being a management consultant because that was a way of making an income and I had done an economics degree with that in mind, as well as law. But I got invited to go on the InterVarsity mooting trip for, New for Monash, and it was in New Zealand. Yep. I hadn't even been to Tasmania. <laughs> so I thought, well, a free trip to New Zealand sounds pretty good. And I won the Blackstone Cup uh, as the best individual speaker, which Excellent. was a great, I mean, I was actually really tickled. And um, the Chief Justice of New Zealand had presided over the final moot, and that conversation that you've recited mm. happened at the drinks session, prize giving thing at the end of it. Um, now, uh, uh, he asked me what I was going to do and I said I was going to be a management consultant and he said, you'd be wasted, you should go to the bar. Yeah. And it did occur to me <laughs> last year that it'd be funny if he meant go and get another glass yeah. of wine because I liked the idea that my life was based on a mistake. Um, and anyway, but later that year, and I mean, that was a key conversation, you know, like 10 seconds career planning. Oh, amazing. Um, but later that year, at Christmas that year, one of the other members of our Monash mooting team gave me a copy of Irving Stone's biography of Clarence Darrow. Now, Darrow was the great American trial lawyer of the first half of the 20th century. And a uh, remarkable man, actually, because, you know, there's a lot of famous lawyers who've got a biography written of them. F.E. Smith has three biographies yep. written of him. And F.E. Smith was nearly a contemporary in England of, uh, of um, Darrow, although he died quite young. Um, but Darrow has seven biographies of him. The latest of them was published only three or four years ago. Oh, wow. And yet he died uh, either before or just during the Second World War. Remarkable, remarkable man. And anyway, reading this biography of Darrow really fired me up. I thought, wow, if that's what being embarrassed yeah, is, sure. bring it on. Excellent. Um, it was actually nothing yeah. like what being embarrassed is, <laughs> but, you know, keep oh, on going. Good. You're, so a lot of people say that your father was a brilliant neurological surgeon. Mm -hmm. And they also said he was very challenging and pushy towards you. Did you find that he was very pushy at any times or he worked with... Like as an advantage? It, it depends on what that means. He was very demanding. Demanding, he, yep. he He set very high standards and um, I think he picked me as the bright one of the litter and he um, sort of tended to push me on to learn sure. more stuff. And I mean, I remember as a small kid helping him make an audio amplifier and learning how to identify the value of a resistor or a condenser or this is well before transistors, of course, <laughs> yep. um, uh, although I did later make a transistor amplifier for myself. Um, but I noticed that he tended to set me projects and when I was achieving them, he would make it a bit harder. And if I was achieving that, he'd make that a bit harder, with the result that I've grown up with a crippling sense of inadequacy um, because I never actually succeeded in the tests that he set. But when you, when you achieved the initial test, did he say you achieved it, I'm going to make it harder? Or he no. Oh, he no, wouldn't no, no. tell you that. He'd make it harder on the run through. <laughs> so that I never had a sense that I had achieved the goal that he'd set. Uh, in fact, what I'd done was achieve way beyond what he'd initially set. But, you know, you don't notice that as a child and I can't persuade myself of it as an adult. So. Well, I think it's worked in the long term. <laughs> 
Well, except that I'm left with this sense of being a failure. So you still have that perception? Oh, yeah. Oh, very that's, that's very interesting. Uh, well, <laughs> if you think it's interesting, oh. <laughs> you can have it. You can <laughs> take it free of charge. <laughs> You've considered the Trevorrow case, the Stolen Generation case in 2007, as one of your proudest achievements. Mm. Uh, what's some of the reasons for that? Um, Bruce Trevorrow was the first uh, Aboriginal person who's been found by a court to have been taken from his parents unlawfully and to be compensated for the damage he suffered as a result. And it was one of those cases, there had been a couple of Stolen Generation cases yep. which had been maybe not well chosen and they'd gone up and failed. and It just looked like one of those areas where you couldn't win. Um, so it was a great thing to win for Bruce. Interesting, um, uh, Bruce's case was I think the only case I've run where the plaintiff was probably the worst testamentary witness I've ever had. Are you serious? He, his <laughs> memory was shot, he was hopeless. Hopeless as a testamentary <laughs> witness. But his two brothers, Tom and George Trevorrow, yeah. um, who hadn't been taken, became leaders of the Nurnjiri community down on the Coorong in South Australia. And the contrast between Tom and George on the one hand and Bruce on the other hand could hardly have been more striking. Oh, wow. So that Bruce was real evidence of the damage which he had suffered. It was quite dramatic. How come that it surprised you that case? Why weren't they successful? Um, the other cases, I mean, I wasn't involved in the mm. other cases and I can't explain the reasons they failed. I suspect that they were just not well-chosen plaintiffs and they were brought in different jurisdictions. One of them, uh, Cabillo and Gunner, was in the Northern Territory where different laws applied and the other one was in New South Wales, again, different laws, because all of these were based, uh, you know, they were all state-based laws that sure. governed them. Um, and it was interesting because the trial ran pretty well. It ran for a few months yep. and the state fought it very hard. Um, and the judge, I thought, was very receptive to our case. But the judgment took longer and longer yeah. and longer. <laughs> and when you're for a plaintiff and that judgment takes months and months and months, you think, oh dear, here's a, here's a problem. Yeah, something's not a good and idea. I'd almost given up hope, but we got the judgment in early August 2007 um, and we won. And it then went on appeal and we held it on appeal, Excellent. which was great. But it was interesting because later in 2007, the election was held and Rudd became the Prime Minister and said that the first business of the first parliament would be an apology to the stolen generations. Oh, that's, yeah, right. And uh, the bureaucrats invited a number of leading Aboriginal people to be in the public gallery to hear the apology. And it was a very fine apology. I think it's one of the, uh, you know, one of the finest moments in the Australian Parliament. Now, Tom and George Trevorrow, being leaders of the Nurnjiri community, were invited to be in the public gallery and the bureaucrats forgot to invite Bruce, <laughs> the only person in the country who can stand up and say, I've got a judgment yeah, of court yeah, yeah. saying I was stolen. Um, we reminded them they hurried out an invitation <laughs> to him. Excellent. But then you see, Bruce died uh, on the 21st of June in 2008, just a few months after the apology. Um, he was 51 at the time younger by a bit than the average Aboriginal male oh, life expectancy. Oh, that's very low then, yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad that he spent the last, well, the last 10 months of his life as a sort of local hero in the town in, in Bensdale where he lived because I think all the Aboriginal community thought he's a man who, Good. you know, got the right result for us all. Excellent. Mm. So you do a lot of work for refugees as well, outside of the courtroom environment? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Most, and, most of it's outside the courtroom. Yep. And I believe you and your wife set up a lot of rooms in your house where you let refugees stay? Well, sort of. Um, Kate is an artist and um, she was horrified by what happened with the Tampa yep. and by what was happening with refugees generally. And being an artist, she said, this is not the way Australia mm -hmm. behaves. We should set up spare rooms for refugees. Just showing hospitality yeah, because that sure. is the Australian way. And I said, well, look, if you want to encourage people to offer free accommodation in their homes for refugees, we have to lead by example. So since late 2001, we've had refugees living with us at home. And 
uh, was interesting. I mean, I actually didn't think her idea, inventive though it was, I didn't think it would work. Um, but we made a sort of web-based enterprise and hmm. put the word out. All of a sudden, we had more <laughs> offers of accommodation yeah. than we had people able to take yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Uh, so it was um, very successful. And it was a sort of a lightning rod for those people who were troubled by what was going on and had no other way of expressing their concern. And would so, have, you would have learnt a lot from their experience as well. Uh, well, I learnt a lot by doing the Tampa case. I mean, when I did the Tampa case, I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know about refugee policy or refugee law. Um, and I had this vague idea that these people came and were turned around and were sent away and problem yeah. arises, problem solved, no need to think about it more. I had other things on my mind. Um, but by doing the Tampa litigation, I discovered there was a great deal more going on. Sure. And um, every case I did exposed me to increasing awfulness in what we were doing to refugees. I just couldn't believe that a country like Australia would behave that way. And now I am convinced that most Australians, I think, I've always thought most Australians are decent people. I think most Australians tolerate what's going on because they have been told relentlessly for 15 years that these people are illegal and now we've been told it's an exercise in border protection. So we're being protected from criminals, you know. Well, it makes sense to mistreat people in order to protect yourself from criminals. But when you discover that they're innocent people, men, women and children, then mistreating them doesn't look quite so respectable. No, I agree. Mm. But the, it was interesting, you know, John Howard was always uh, very lucky with his timing. The judgment of Justice North in the Tampa litigation was handed down at 2.15 in the afternoon, Melbourne time, on the 11th of September 2001. I, oh my gosh. And, uh, ten hours later there's the attack on America. Oh my gosh. Everyone wakes up the next morning to yeah. see the horrors and all of a sudden you don't have terrorists, you only have Muslim terrorists. You don't have boat people, you only have Muslim boat people. And all of a sudden they're illegal. So that's how it played out. Mm. And the illegals tag has stuck and it has brought this country to a position now where we are being criticised by almost every other country in the world, but we sit here insulated from all of the international reaction, thinking that we're doing the right thing to protect our borders. Well, I understand. Mm. There will be a lot of people out there who would be very keen to be in your position, so if not working in uh, commercial litigation, who also help, like to help out with human rights and refugees, what are some words of advice you give to these people? Um, first, if you want to be a lawyer practicing in human rights, it's probably a good idea to become a good lawyer, generally. Because human rights lawyers are not regarded as having any significance in this country, um, and you don't get paid for it. And of course we measure everything by what you're paid to do it. Um, so if you, you want to be taken seriously as a lawyer. And, and I would certainly say to people, unless they happen to be independently rich, um, get yourself the best job in the law you can and um, do human rights on the side as the opportunity arises. And, like you know, pro bono work? Yeah, yeah well, sure. it's all pro, pretty much all pro bono. I mean, I know there are some cases where you win and you get an order for cost, but as a matter of principle, I don't accept payment for any refugee work because um, there's too many people sniping at me on Twitter. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon I'm doing it to make yeah, myself yeah, rich. Yeah. God. Very limited no. understanding. I think of the they're st stereotyping this. That yeah. could be a case. Yeah, I, I don't think I know any refugee lawyers who make a lot of money out of it, to be honest. And so. is there any advice in terms of what type of education they should get? Um, no, a good education is always better than a bad education. Um, I, I have a view of which I'm, I'm sure um, um, career planning teachers can't stand. But my view is, don't even dream about planning your career whilst you're at school. Uh, in my opinion, you don't know which way is up until you're, probably until you've finished university. Um, I reckon the key is stack your mind with as much knowledge as you can, and when the right opportunity comes along, you'll be ready for it. That was but good, wasn't it? You won't know what it is yeah. until it comes. 
Sometimes I guess planning excessively it may not be a good thing. You have no, too many no. options. Well, yeah. you know, one of my favourite short stories is a short story by Frederick Raphael in a collection of short stories called Oxbridge Blues. And it's about people, you know, at one of the main English universities. And this is about a guy who, uh, as a young man, liked writing poetry, but who was accepted into law uh, at Oxbridge and there met the girl who later became his wife. And she persuaded him gently to forget about poetry and concentrate on, being, on doing law. Yep. And he does well and he becomes a barrister and he does well at that and becomes a silk and he does well at that and becomes a judge. So he has to spend a weekend in his chambers clearing out the accumulated <laughs> paperwork of yeah. a, a lifetime in the law. And he comes across a pile of his old poetry at the bottom of a cupboard. And in the final paragraph of the story it says that he decided to read them for a laugh he thought they would provide clinching evidence of the wisdom of following his wife's gentle guidance. But instead, the author says, those unburnt embers passed judgment on his life. Oh, wow. And he said he closed his eyes to escape their unflinching gaze, but the, the eye in the centre of his forehead gazed and blazed with a unique and undeniable vision, and he realised that the years of his life hmm. had escaped like Odysseus's uh, panicky, or, uh, like Odysseus's men under the panicky sheep of the blind, deluded Polyphemus. And he cried, who are you, who are you? And the man who had blinded himself replied, no one. That is the price mm. you pay yeah. if you drive yourself into a career that's the wrong career. Parents may want you to be an accountant or a mathematician or an astrophysicist or a lawyer do what you want to do. Learn enough so that when you get the chance to do what you want to do, you'll be ready to do it. Excellent. No, good advice. Yeah. And just the last question I have is, do you still listen to classical music to relax? Oh, all the time. <laughs> all the time. All the time. Which, uh, which particular artists do you like? Uh, look, my favourite segment style of classical music is string quartets. Um, my favourite composer has always been Beethoven and still is. Although I do like Shostakovich. If I'm preparing a cross examiner, show Shostakovich <laughs> string quartet's quite good. Good. Um, uh, I, I don't think I have favourite um, individual performers, but. Very good. Yeah. Well, Julian, thank you once again for taking some time out to do the interview. And uh, personally, I learned a lot about your law career and your human rights and refugees. So, best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching the episode of The Voice of a Leader. Julian Burnside has an incredible memory. I'm sure when you watched the interview, you'd notice there were parts where he was just giving quotes off by heart. Amazing. I really personally also liked how he said, if you're pursuing something, do something you enjoy, not, something, not some career that people, other people are telling you to do. Thank you again for watching this episode. Remember, if you or someone you know is a high achieving leader and would like to have an interview with me, please visit my website answer three questions, and send an email to thevoiceoverleader at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and like my Facebook page so you're kept up to date with the series. Thank you once again. See you next time.